Welcome to day 23 of the macOS and iOS security internals advent calendar. Today we will be looking into read-only kernel data structures. So ever since the release of iOS 6, Apple has uh, started to move vital uh, kernel data into um, read-only pages. Um, this was done to protect uh, a certain data from being overwritten by simple kernel read-write uh, primitives. Um, so basically to make the kernel uh, exploitation harder. Um, initially what they did is they used uh, the low-level CPU page table bits to switch uh, the pages uh, read-only at runtime. Uh, basically after the kernel and kernel extensions have performed the initialization and this allowed them basically to not only have real read-only data in there but also stuff that is only written once at the start of the kernel and then later on uh, can remain uh, read-only. And ever since the iPhone 7 came out, uh, Apple has uh, more and more hardware security features built into their own CPUs and so since the iPhone 7, uh, they're actually using uh, new features like KTRR or CTRR uh, to make this lockdown even uh, more tight. Um, but the way this worked was actually only feasible for static data. So runtime uh, kernel data structures could not be protected from being overwritten at all. With the release of iOS 15 and macOS Monterey, um, Apple basically changed all of that. Uh, they started to build up the infrastructure uh, to make uh, re uh, data structures of the kernel uh, read only at runtime so that even changeable uh, data structures can be protected from uh, just write primitives uh, corrupting kernel memory. Uh, they're using the PPLXPRR feature for that and what this basically means is that they make the memory read only for uh, kernel land uh, but uh, in their PPL layer in the GFX mode uh, they can actually write to it because under this mode the memory is uh, writable. So um, how did they do that? Well, what they did is they extended the zone allocator to now also understand the concept of uh, read-only zones. Uh, for that, they have uh, an own function which is called zalloc underscore ro, uh, which basically is available for allocating uh, memory in these read-only zones. Um, for that, they added uh, a bunch of uh, new zone IDs uh, and these zone IDs you can see uh, this tells you which data structures at the moment are protected with this read-only allocator. And you can see here the thread uh, data, MAC labels, uh, PROC structures, SIG actions from PROCs, uh, KAuth credentials, code signing blobs. These are the data structures that the main kernel basically can make read-only, or but let's say uh, it's part of the stuff that they make read-only. And then uh, they have the so-called ex external read-only zones. So sandbox, uh, sandbox profile, protobox, SB filter, and uh, from the AMFI, the AMFI OS entitlements. So all of these are basically uh, read-only zones used by kernel extensions. These here are from the main kernel and these are basically from uh, kernel extensions. And so the idea is now when you want to allocate inside these zones, you have to use the zone alloc RO uh, function, otherwise it will not work. So, um, and the idea is then that the memory you allocate is basically read only by uh, default. So um, to find out which structures are read only, uh, you would have to go into the XNU source code and search around and then you will find that they have created new uh, substructures uh, for uh, the structures that they are trying to protect and uh, they've basically taking out all the element fields that are they're interested in 
to be protected and they put them in substructures. So here, for example, they have taken some fields from the uh, proc structure and they now call this proc underscore ro. So this is the read only part of the proc structure uh, that should not be uh, written to uh, by uh, kernel writes. So you can see there's a bunch of stuff in there. There's, for example, a part that is uh, for proc uh, data, then they have a task data, uh, and then they have uh, certain things like the code signing flags, the cre credentials pointer, uh, the system call filters, um, and uh, other stuff like the unique ID and so on. Uh, here they have the task tokens, they have the filters, they have uh, some flags um, and the uh, control port options and all of this they consider security relevant so they don't want kernel exploits to be able to just switch this off by uh, a write. So um, what they do is now they have this uh, in here and they have also back pointers to the actual uh, proc structure and the task structure that this read only uh, substructure is actually the, um, designed for. This is for later finding out if something was modified uh, or uh, not. So let's see how this is actually going on. So uh, when we look into the original proc structure now, we will see that there is actually now an entry for our read-only structure here. So there's a pointer that points to the read-only structure. And the idea is now that the code is changed to never actually use this pointer directly. Instead, they are using accessor functions. Uh, by doing this, they can add a, a number of additional security uh, checks automatically. So uh, when you look at the accessor function here, this would be proc get ro, uh, you will see it does two main things here. The first thing is it runs zone require ro on this uh, pointer. Uh, this basically ensures that uh, nobody tampered with the pointer and made it point to some arbitrary memory. Because keep in mind, we have a pointer here. So theoretically, an attacker could point this anywhere they wanted. So it could be in read-write memory and they could uh, provide whatever they wanted. But by having a zone require here, this actually ensures that this is actually not pointing anywhere but in reality pointing into a proc ro zone. And uh, that's the first part of the check. The second part is they can also check if the uh, proc that is referenced by this uh, um, proc ro is actually the same as the process that we, uh, that we want. So basically they're checking if the back reference pointer is pointing to the object itself uh, because if that's not the case, then maybe someone corrupted the pointer to point to a different process's read-only data. But this is not possible because of the back pointer check here. And of course, this will cause a panic in case you uh, uh, manipulate this uh, pointer. Okay, so now how do these uh, structures get used in the real code? Uh, here you can see that Apple has also created helper functions to create this new data structures. And here you can, for example, see the code that is used, the function that is used for allocating a proc RO structure. And what you can see here is uh, it gets the data that's supposed to be inside there and the proc structure that we want to allocate this for. And then it calls simply that alloc underscore RO allocates an element and uh, fixes the, um, the pointers inside this uh, uh, structure uh, to basically uh, point into uh, the right place. Uh, how this is written to, we will see in a moment, but for now, this is just like uh, taking the memory and making use of it. Okay. So now, how do you actually write to read-only data? Uh, because if you just allocate something, uh, it would be an empty element. And yeah, you always need to at least write to something once. Uh, you maybe don't need to update it, but you need to at least write to it once. But uh, if you just use setalloc.ro, the memory is actually not accessible from the kernel. 
and uh, this is done by using basically helper functions that uh, go on the deepest level down into the PPL mode to basically uh, update this memory element. And so the functions that exist for this, for example, are uh, zalloc underscore ro underscore uh, mutate. Uh, this is for actually just writing to the lowest, uh, uh, to, to the element. Um, so this is the function that is basically uh, just writing to this area and has the most features. Then you have the zalloc ro update element which basically is used to update one element, uh, which would be one allocation of this kind of structure. And then you have a, a function that wraps around this, which is the update field. So this is when you only want to update one single field inside a structure, then you can use this. Uh, and then they have the same thing for uh, for zeroing out the memory. They have a clear function and the clear field. So you can either clear the whole element or you can clear just one field inside uh, the element. And as I said, this is basically implemented by just uh, switching into the PPL mode and a GFX mode and basically then doing a mem copy mem move. Uh, because at this level uh, the memory is actually writable, while the kernel can only read this mem memory. Okay, so let's see how this works in the real world. Here, for example, we can see the same uh, proc ro alloc functions, but this time we can see how this is actually written to. Um, we see we are updating an element, uh, the PR field here, and we are writing the actual uh, local uh, uh, filled out data structure into this field. So after that, uh, we have the initial initialization of this field. Uh, yeah, basically, um, uh, the, the whole element basically uh, initially initialized. Uh, that's uh, all the magic, uh, how the code then basically can do this. Again, if you want to modify a single field, you would need to run that alloc ro update uh, uh, field. And then of course you have to specify where the field is and how long the field is. Uh, but this is possible if you just want to, uh, to update one single element. So with this set of functions, uh, it is now no longer possible to corrupt this uh, um, here from kernel land. Um, you need to be in PPL to actually make modifications to it. But the code can still do this. They can still modify it. Uh, but only ever through these accessor functions um, and never uh, by uh, an actual just simple kernel write. So let's see how this really works on the lowest level. So um, as I told you, all of this basically is a wrapper around set alloc ro mut. And this mutate function basically uh, will do some checking here and then it will call pmap ro zone mem copy uh, because it will do a, a PPL level mem copy basically. And that's all it basically doing. It's just copying it over, but running in uh, the PPL mode so that it can actually do this. Um, also, of course, that, that code here was actually part of XNU or official source code. So you can read this actually inside uh, the source code. So then the next thing we have is the PMAP RO zone mem copy. Um, that will internally call the PMAP RO zone mem copy PPL. Um, because simply uh, the point here is that we want to uh, do this in a protected way. So if this monitor, if this protection is not available, it will directly do um, internal mem copy because uh, then we don't have the PPL level in between. Uh, but yeah, of course, normally we have the PPL level. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the source code for this function, of course, is also available. But now this changes because now we're drilling down into the PPL level and uh, this is where Apple does not ship source code. Uh, nobody really knows why. Apple has just this habit to uh, create new security features and then they keep the stuff private. 
which is in a way stupid because uh, all of this stuff can be put through a, a decompiler and comp comb combined with the real source code. It makes absolutely no sense to make this uh, not available uh, because everybody can just try to decompile it. And everybody who is interested in this kind of stuff, they have all of this stuff decompiled. So it really makes not much sense. It also just hinders people who are just researchers to maybe uh, spot errors in this and report them to Apple. Uh, it just doesn't make really sense to keep this stuff private. Anyway, so as I said, uh, this next level is now the Pima Bro Zone memcopy PPL function, and that function doesn't have any source code. But it's also not very complicated because it just calls the GXF PPL enter handler uh, to call, uh, in this case, handler uh, 4C hex, which is internally basically Pima Bro Zone memcopy PPL internal. And uh, there is no source code for this available, as I said, but yeah, as I said, it's not that uh, much rocket science. So now let's let's drill down into this last level and see what's going on here, actually. So this is now the lowest level, the, the thing that Apple keeps so secure and private. Um, and this is the decompiled version of this code. Um, so you can see here what happens is it uh, does some magic around the uh, the virtual address that comes in. Uh, it determines the uh, um, the physical address for it. It validates this element. It will then lock the physical page, uh, perform the mem copy, and then unlock the uh, physical page. And so the thing here is, as I said, in this level, uh, we have a different set of uh, page permissions because we're running in the PPL level. <clears throat> and so now uh, we can simply do a mem copy or mem move here. Uh, the memory here will not be protected. Uh, only in kernel land, it's basically read only. Yes, and that's everything you need to know about the new uh, read only memory structures that are uh, dynamically usable that can be updated on the fly. Um, this is how it works. And this is uh, now the second to last day of the advent calendar. So uh, I hope you have a great day and you will have a great uh, evening. Uh, see you tomorrow for the final and last day of the uh, um, advent calendar.